Okay, good. So, uh, Richard Oppenlander, O P P E N L A N D E R, dentist, and I guess doctor would be the right way to refer to you. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity of uh, meeting you initially at our advanced study weekend in March of 2012, and and uh, you know I took a break there for a while too. There, there was time when I kind of lost my way in terms of uh, focusing on food and the environment and so on. So I'd like to know, and first of all, I want to encourage everybody to go, go to our website, uh, drmcdougall.com, and, and see this phenomenal presentation. I don't know how Dr. Oppenlander can do better than his presentation, which was an hour and 20 minutes that, that fixed my attention. But you need to see what he had to say, too, and we're going to find out what he has to say 10 years later. So uh, welcome. But back to the, the McDougal, uh, the McDougal adventure, which is uh, trying to get the world to be a better place, and it's been frustrating the last ten years, hasn't it? It sure has. It sure has. And I, you know, I, I greatly appreciate the, the introduction there and and uh, the encouragement because it's uh, there's a lot of work to do, and and you know, I think the comprehensiveness of what I, what I had presented at your uh, wonderful event remains remains the same. It's just the numbers have changed. You know, perspectives have changed a little bit, and I think the dynamics of solutions have changed a little bit. And you know, without creating a great deal of uh, pessimism, the timelines have changed. And and as you know, you know, I I presented very very clear timelines ten years ago, and nothing has changed. It hasn't necessarily gotten better by any means. And so the timelines remain the same. We're just slowly diminishing the amount of time we have to really make a big difference, which is why I think it's imperative that everyone, you know, educates themselves, li listens to people like you, you know, who are one of our true leaders and, um, and make sure that they do what they can to, to foster um, a better planet for those that come after us. And I know you really appreciate that thought with your family as well. But, you know, you, we, we certainly, I think it's nearly embarrassing, you know, that that our generations in the last 50 to 100 years are the ones that are responsible for such a massive amount of, of problems in our in our planet. So I think I think the, cha the challenge is education still, but then realizing that the timelines were on demand more urgency, but then, you know, that's difficult line to, walk, isn't it? You know, you, you, you then don't want to create panic, but, you know, in the other direction, if a, if you see a child that's out in the, you know, out in the street and it's about ready to get hit by a car, you run out and grab it. You don't, you know, you get, you, 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 you change the dynamics of that situation. And here it's not quite as, as acute as that, of course, it's over a long period of time. So we don't see it. It's not, you know, the damage we're doing to our planet is not right in front of us. It seems like, it is, but it isn't. So I think it's up to it, it's up to you and and me to try to try to educate and then try to in a positive fashion find solutions for everybody. But yeah, it's uh, nothing has really changed other than the timelines we're on in the last and the numbers. The numbers have changed a little bit too since uh, that presentation ten years ago. Well, the uh, yeah, that was in March of two thousand and twelve. And I believe you started your presentation say, saying we had like three or four years left to make important changes. The next year, I had uh, Robert Goodland, who uh, is involved with World Watch Institute, who said that 51% of the global warming gases are, are caused by the agriculture industry. And he told us we had three years left. And now I'm dealing with, uh, with some really important scientists like Peter Carter, MD. Mm -hmm. who uh, really just thinks the ball game's over. Mm -hmm. And Guy McSpearson, same thing, mm -hmm. the ball game's over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I just can't give up. I, I just can't keep fighting the battle myself. I can't believe, I, I just can't see quitting. And it sounds to me like you feel the same way. Well, right, how can you right. quit? Well, well, you can't. And I think my new message, thank, thank you for saying that. I think the new message uh, contrary to what your colleagues are saying, is that if you really can see the the problem at hand, 
and and then see a, a solution. And the, solu the, the, the clear solution I outline in two separate one and a half hour lectures, you know, as you know, in Stephen Shore's The Real Truth About Health just a couple weeks ago. But but although the timeline we have, first of all, they're right in a sense that we've exceeded a few of these parameters these timelines in fact i call it global depletion as you know there's maybe like nine or ten different categories of global depletion from freshwater use to land use to climate change and all that um but there are other i mean there's scientists that are involved with uh uh watching uh planetary boundaries and creating or, or explaining uh um, designating uh, and outlining planetary boundaries, which are the same as really what I'm talking about. And they've all indicated that six out of nine of those boundaries we've already passed. So the issue isn't so much, is it, should we give up? You're right, we can't give up. And so if, you, if we pass those boundaries, there is a way to minimize the damage and minimize any further um, uh, planetary issues that we have. For, for instance, just a real quick example about climate change. Climate change it, it is not is not the real problem. It's the uh, we can get our foot in the door now because more and more people. You know that at that um, event that you had ten years ago, I spent a good portion of that event explaining what climate change was or is. You know, at that time, I, nobody really wanted to talk about it. Nobody really understood it. You know, as a global warming type of uh, discussion from Al Gore, but now um, many people don't want to do anything about it. And there's a political issue going on there too, a uh, geopolitical issue as well. But, the, but the, foot in, the foot's in the door because most countries realize that, right, we have passed, uh, no matter what we do right now today, according to climate scientists, at least for that one portion of global depletion, as I call it, or planetary boundaries, which we've passed, that one portion, yeah, we we we've already exceeded the 1.5 degrees centigrade. We will not get that back down. And even if they, even with the conference of the parties uh, targets, even if they're met, it's predicted that we'll likely still reach two degrees centigrade rise, which you know brings up all these other issues. But but there's a way to even change that if we just can change our diet and change um, the political aspect and change the way that we're using subsidies. Um, so, for instance, just a quick example, you know, many people are talking about the one, you know, plant one trillion trees project. Well, that's nonsense because uh, while we're out, I mean, for goodness sakes, the reason we need to plant more trees is because of what we're eating. We cut down all the trees. So the very first thing we need to do is realize that we have to stop, you know, eating what we're eating, stop all animal agriculture completely, period, from terrestrial uh, sources as well as our oceans. And then once we do that, you will, you will free up, essentially, there's about 4 billion hectares, um, which is about 12, 12 billion acres in the world that's taken up by grazing livestock and crops to feed them. Well, if you just take all that away, which can, can be done, uh, might take five years to 10 years, but if you do that, it's not a trillion trees that can be planted. It's more like eight trillion to 10, 10 trillion. It's not the amount of, yeah, it's not the amount of trees. It's first, we have to stop eating animals and stop all those agricultural systems that are causing the depletion. And then realize that it's not just climate change. It's even if we didn't have climate change, we'd still run out of water. We'd still run out of, our, you know, we'd still be deforesting. We'd still ruin our oceans. We'd still have 960 million people that are suffering from hunger each year. Um, climate change doesn't. It, it'll. It's an exacerbator, as you know. And that it's. It takes an existing event and makes it worse. We created all these other events, you know, and whether climate change is here or not, the events are still going to take place. The climate change doesn't really have anything to do with us depleting all of our oceans of fish. It, it doesn't. It just makes it worse. So anyway, the point is we just got to, we have to, you know, recognize what we're doing to our planet, then change the agricultural systems, because then whatever amount of trees it is, it's likely eight to 10 times as much as these one trillion uh, tree planters are thinking about doing. Um, but you first have to stop, you know, what we're doing with a silly diet that we have with a, a animal agriculture, then you can plant the trees and then you can you and then those trees, that land that 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 those 4 billion hectares, you can do the math all you want. There's no climate scientist would disagree with me about this is that it would equal between five and 10 years from now, the equivalent of about 108 to 181 gigatons of equivalent greenhouse gases per year of drawing down out of our atmosphere. Well, we're pumping in 
about the nat natural causes are about 20 to 25 gigatons per year. And then us humans are, are anthropogenically are placing in about 39 to 40. So together it's about 65, 70 uh, gigatons. So we're gonna draw down double that much, meaning we can take, we can, we can use all the cars we want. We'd still be able to, well, this is not what I would suggest doing, but you know, we still wanna work on fossil fuels, but fossil fuel is not the problem. If you take away all the fossil fuels, we're still going to have all these depletion of everything else that we've just talked about. But if you can draw down 180 gigatons per year, you're going to not only uh, mitigate entirely all the greenhouse gases that we're emitting, but you start drawing down the you know the 477 you know uh, uh, parts per million greenhouse or carbon dioxide that's already in our atmosphere that we've that we've placed since 1850. So you can see, and it only take. 10 years, probably five to 10 years to draw that down. Instead of looking at, you know, dropping, you know, fossil fuels and, and then working on technology. And, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's the, the very top of the line right now, uh, very uh, most engineered uh, carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas um, um, uh, drawdown project is Climeworks from Iceland, and they've they've created one unit that is it costs about fifteen million dollars, and it's predicted to take a hundred million of those, and over seventy five to hundred years to draw down all the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that exists right now. When you could draw it all down without spending one point five quadrillion dollars <laughs> on it, just by stop eating animals and stop, you know, and stop the animal agriculture and then reforest all these. In fact, you don't even have to reforest, although that's in one of my suggested uh, job, you know, a very positive aspect of this is we can create over 200 million jobs over, you know, between now and 2030 at a tune and increase our, our uh, revenues to about $3.6 trillion. And that's just not my figures. Those are some things that I had calculated, but the World Economic Forum uh, just uh, uh, had come out with those figures themselves about a year ago. So there's lots of optimism here, but we have to, you know, it starts with like those colleagues of yours understanding too that, yeah, we've passed some timelines, but there's a way to even reverse out. I think there's a way to reverse out, you know, climate change. It's not going to, it's not going to change the 50% of all coral reef systems that are in danger right now, but it'll, but it'll bring them back likely a few hundred years from now, and it'll reduce the likelihood that the other 50% will be gone just by the year 2050, which is predicted it will be. And so there's a lot of optimism here, and you know that, and that's why you well, and I are not going to quit. That's, that's what I want to hear from you, because uh, you know the message is out there. Not only are we in big trouble, but nobody's willing to fix it. And, and people need to have some optimism. Uh, yeah, I, I, I found, you know, I've had a, a couple of experiences like trying to get the idea that we need to change our diet, we need to become vegans, basically, uh, in order to get a handle on this fossil fuel is not going to get it. And, you know, I can't get the newspapers to, to buy into it, even to print a letter to the editor. Uh, I went and talked to the American College of Lifestyle and Medicine uh, back in October of 2019. They gave me an award, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And, you know, I agreed to do to take to accept the award, award, but I wanted to have a little time to talk to the 500 members, doctors, primarily doctors and dietitians who know about a plant food based diet. And, you know, it's, it's just so slow, uh, the, the change. But, you know, I just there's a couple other things I want to say before we go on. Since sure. we talked, since we've talked, there's been there's been uh, about eight scientific papers and I put in on a on the new website I've developed, which is uh, uh, it's uh, mcdougallfoundation.org. And, and they tell us that, it, it, there's no disagreement. They tell us that we can reduce our contribution of global warming gases by 50 to 87% almost overnight by just mm -hmm. changing to a vegan diet. But uh, it seems like nobody nobody's listening yet. I guess the next question I have is, uh, do you know what that, that point of uh, of awareness will happen in terms of the general public. Do we have to have Florida buried under four feet of water? Uh, what what is it? What do you what do you see that's going to mm -hmm. cause people to wake up? Yeah. Well, I mean that is that is the answer to that question. Really, is the answer to our our dilemma, isn't it? So my thought is is that um, 
I'm going to, I'm going to go back to what you and I talked about just a few minutes ago. Um, 10 years ago, there was another stepping stone that now I believe uh, we've, we've, it's, it's still slightly there, but we've passed it. And, and that stepping stone has now turned into a, a pathway, like a doorway opening, and that's climate change. So now they're not moving nearly as fast on just climate change by itself as they should. Um, and certainly animal agriculture is not even a component of their discussions yet. But um, if you have 200 nations or 195 nations, you know, getting heat from, you know, many different sources that they need to step up right now today about climate change and how can we do this? And they're starting to draft. Um, uh, now, nothing's binding, of course, you know that. And, you know, there's there are metrics that are issues there. You know, there's I mean, really, the cop. 26 was pretty much a mess. But the point is, is that there's 200, yeah, there's 200 nations now that are at least realizing that the timelines have been surpassed and we're, and we're really going to struggle here. And, and I feel like the door has been open enough to where, in fact, I spoke to the European Parliament a few years ago before I had to take a step away. And, um, and I think there's like 28 to 30 countries involved there. And at least half of them wanted me there <laughs> they wanted me there to speak and and had follow up um and they their intent is there they just need um i think that point of awareness uh will happen uh through climate change and through understanding the, and then connecting the dots to these other areas of global depletion um now you know i think everybody in the world should watch uh Cowspiracy, first of all, and that's not, some, not that's not a plug for just you know something I was involved with. I think that that's a pretty comprehensive view of where we are, you know, with our environment and how we can change it drastically. But I think that point of awareness that you're that you asked that question so eloquently is that um, is through is through climate change, and it's soon. It's coming real soon. Uh, I think we need to have. Uh, and I'm working on it right now. I just, I can't divulge a lot about it, but I, and I wish I had more energy than I have, you know, I, I have to sleep sometimes, but I'm working on a couple of really large projects for public awareness, which would then likely put some pressure on the, on the, on the political aspect and the political aspect. I want your, your viewers to know that it's not just about, you know, let's just uh, have everyone have everyone turn vegan and, and the world will be a better place. They need to see kind of what I've outlined in those last two lectures about jobs that can be created. And realistically, like you take the, you know, the 39 to 60 million fisher people in the world and, you know, the ones that are coming to you and say, Dr. McDougall, that's crazy because we're going to lose our job. You know, we can't just stop fishing. Well, you take the subsidies that are involved in fishing at you know, right now, 35 to $40 billion a year. And you take the $750 billion that are in animal agriculture in general each year, and you use that money to transition them to other jobs and jobs such as for, for, for fishing, they could still have uh, blue, what I would call more blue, blue jobs, blue, uh, blue type of conceptual jobs. And there's, then there's terrestrial land jobs. You could, you could transfer those and you could use you could use money to help fund them. And I've spoken to a number of organic farmers that would just love to have a little bit of subsidies given to them instead of all the money going to their, their fathers and, and, you know, and aunts and uncles that are still doing dairy that are ruining our planet. So I think if you put this right in front of politicians and at the same time have a higher uh, public awareness, and there are ways to do that. I mean, I, 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 it's going to be a large project, but I, I've got a few people in the, in, in the media, some with really... Uh, significant platforms and um, between entertainers to, to those in the music industry. And I just have to kind of put it together. And I, it's my grand idea of, you know, how to affect as many people as fast as possible to help our planet. And then, um, and then put these, put these real uh, clear incentives uh, in, uh, of, of, in front of politicians in terms of, well, here's how you can generate income. And um, now granted, I mean, you know, it might sound like a pie in the sky to some of your colleagues, you know, but we have we have to do it. We have to start somewhere and we have to do it. And I think that with the door being open from climate change, it should be a whole lot easier now than it was 10 years ago. I guess that's my point. I, I hope so. But the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, this past year, they didn't even mention agriculture as a problem. Uh, no. it, uh, we're, we're, we, we just, you know, the awareness is not there. I've had heard a statement that all we have to do is get the bankers 
the world bankers involved decide we're going to stop we're going to stop spending the money on destroying the planet. I I can't imagine that these bankers are are not mothers and fathers with children and grandchildren that have this same kind of concern, unless yeah. they don't recognize it. it no, uh, well, I mean that's a great that's a great uh, issue you, you brought up. I spoke. I think five or six years ago to the international uh, uh, microfinance uh, group, um, which is really what you're talking about. This is microfinance. So they're the ones responsible for financing all those um, uh, underdeveloped countries, the developing countries uh, in Mozambique and Uganda. And we set up programs for them. And I, my goal in speaking to them was to do just what you said is to make sure they understood what responsible financing means. And uh, which cannot mean um, the, you know, the over guzzling of our resources to then, you know, when it's all said and done to create further human health issues. Um, so all animal agriculture has to be out of the picture to, develop, to, to be, uh, to be um, recognized as a, as a responsible financial institution. So, I mean, there needs to be that, you're exactly right. We need to work on financial institutions. Now where that went, uh, I, I've just started back again. So I'm just only now trying to, I've been pretty busy just trying to reconnect with these. Um, I've been on a board of directors of a number of different international um, finance groups and also world hunger projects. And so I think all this is going to be coming together, but you're exactly right. Uh, we need to, and I, I'm big, as you know, on uh, definitions, you know, what the definitions are of, you know, sustainable. And, and, and now we have, see, we have things in place. We have like the sustainable development goals, as you know. I mean, those were originally the millennial development goals, eight of them in 2000. And at the heart of those to, you know, to, to eliminate world hunger and poverty and, um, you know, sickness and, and is, is, is how to create sustainable agriculture and sustainable food. So they, they don't even have that defined correctly, as you know, because they have animal agriculture as the centerpiece again. And so we have to make sure that everybody has a universal definition uh, in, involved in that too. And then once that happens, I mean, uh, I think things can roll out from that, but it's a multifaceted type of uh, project. It really is. We need more of you you know, out there. Uh, I was just about to say the same thing. We need more of you, but you're, <laughs> you're, you're a very attractive person in terms of people would have a lot of respect for you. You have a great smile. You have a way of getting along with people. I just sure hope that you, uh, you know, that you really get out there and keep trying to make an influence on the public. And I also like the fact that you don't, you don't moderate this thing. I mean, you say, look, no. we've got to quit. We've got to give it up. Uh, we have to make radical changes because you know uh, big changes result yeah. you know, in, in big improvements and, and we can't do any small changes. You know, can I just take you back from there? I just want to know a little sure. bit about you. Uh, <laughs> when, when did you become aware of the problem? It, you know, I, I started out as a doctor as I talked in this, uh, you know, did the introduction for you 12 years ago or 10 years ago. I started out explaining I started as a doctor. It was totally unaware of the environmental issues and the animal rights issues. You're a dentist, you know, I, I don't know enough about you, but I'd sure like to know more about you. Could you could you just explain to us how you became, what do they call it, woke? You know, aware? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, I remember that um, I, I, sp I had the privilege of speaking at your event twice. And I do remember vividly the introduction you gave me, but more so even afterwards, you know, because I don't know if you heard my whole presentation yet but afterwards you're so kind and so encouraging um and uh and it is true uh i i i, I started i started down this path uh pretty aggressively in the last probably 25 to 30 years because i even though i wasn't a, a medical doctor i was doing quite a bit of medical research at university of michigan um, as a graduate student and i started seeing on a cellular level level how you know, cells were being lysed, you know, just by changing the composition, I, I would, you know, make a change and all of a sudden I'd get in trouble, you know, from too much potassium or one thing or another. And I started realizing from a human health standpoint where it was, but then immediately I thought, well, how is food really being produced? You know, not only is it on a nutrient or macro or micronutrient level or, you know, a pathophysiological level or biochemical level, but where's our food coming from? 
So I started looking at that carefully about 40, 45 years ago, 50 years ago. And then for myself, changed and just said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I saw what was going on behind the scenes, you know, that tripod of, you know, issues between human health and how, where our animals, what, how, we're, how we're treating our animals and also our environment came into bigger picture. But, you know, the other part to that is I want to point out is that it, I learned early on, it's not, you know, you know this as well as I do, but years and years ago, it was never a question of, about loss of biodiversity or, you know, nobody had a conscience about that. It was always about, far, you know, factory farming, right? I mean, the CAFOs and, the, uh, you know, concentrated, concentrated animal feeding operations. And it was never 50 years ago about loss of biodiversity. And hence, here we are today, knowing that uh, over a million plant and animal species over the next couple decades will become extinct. And that's uh, from the most comprehensive uh, ecosystem uh, study that's ever been accomplished just in 2019. So I started seeing that back then. And then, so I changed for myself. And then somewhere around 1990 or so, I started realizing this is kind of selfish of me because I, I, I don't see the world changing. And, you know, what am I, you know, from, and sure, I, you know, I'm going to have my own small footprint and try to do the best I can. But it, I woke up every morning thinking this is, I'm, I don't feel good about um, my, what I'm doing and I'm not doing enough. And then the whole kicker for me was Al Gore uh, with, uh, with his uh, global warming slash climate change and winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And I thought, well, this is a good start. And then you start reading through and seeing what he was really saying and what platform he came from. And he was a promoter. He and his family were promoters. As you know, they were promoters of animal agriculture. And again, a less than one small paragraph on page 300. 35 or whatever it is in his 500 page book, you know, The Inconvenient Truth, that's all that he, he mentioned vaguely about maybe we need to reduce, uh, you know, our consumption of meat or something. Well, that just really made me upset. And uh, so then I decided, you know what, um, then I started uh, researching what's being said about it uh, globally, uh, knowing that it's a global problem. And nothing was being said at that time, as you know. So then I decided, well, right, I don't, I don't care what my title is or what I was officially trained in. You know, I, I, I traveled all over the world. I mean, every continent, just about it, except Antarctica. And um, and I visited so many different farms and uh, researching just everything I possibly could, hands on. And then decided I better write a book. And then I decided I better talk about it. And then I yeah. decided well, that's that's not enough. I better write another book. And then, and then I decided, well, you know what, I better, I better help a couple producers and documentary film, you know, makers, because they didn't have the story right either. So I thought I'd help, you know, cowspiracy and seaspiracy and all those and food choices. And so anyway, so that's my journey. And it's still now, after five years, honestly, Dr. McDougall, I thought, you know, we went through a lot of tragedy in our family. And I, uh, towards the end of it all, I, I, it was really hard for me to come back. And I thought, well, you know what, somebody's got to be there's got to be changes and there, and somebody's got to be saying something. So let's see who's changing it. Well, nobody is, there's no change. And so I, here I am. So here I am. So that's my, that's my journey past to present and likely future until I'm gone from this planet, you know, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep fighting. <laughs> well, Dr. Richard Oppenlander, I, I, I've, you know, I've been through some difficult times too. And, you know, you know what they say, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you a better person. And I think that's so yeah. true. And, and uh, you know, I don't know the details of your problems, but I know you went through a tremendous amount of difficulty, personal issues. And I just hope you're back. I, we need you so much. You have such a positive message. Anybody who's listening to this interview, you, as soon as we get finished, you, you have to go to my website and look up uh, Richard Oppenlander. And spend an hour and 20 minutes, you'll be fixated on the presentation. I, I, before we just had a chance to talk, I said, I'll watch the entire thing. And I look forward to watching it again. You got it so right. <laughs> the, world, you. the world just, the world just absolutely needs you. Yeah, and, I'm going to try. Um, and I really appreciate that. I really do. I think um, the issue is, again, how, f how fast, how quickly we can make. It's not a, this is not a simple exercise anymore. It's a, it's, it's mandatory. And again, you got to find the fine line of not creating too much urgency. But again, you've got to pull that little child out of the street. You know, we're, we're, we're in the street about ready to be hit by a car. It's just 
you know, going to take over the next 20, 30 years. But so I, I have some plans. I just, you know, I just, we need to uh, have, have the public uh, with a greater awareness, and then we have to combine it with a, uh, some political action. And so I, I have, I have a pretty good idea. I hope you do, because, you know, I see so much talent, you know, so much opportunity for you to, to make a difference, to open people's eyes. And they do need to have their eyes open. You know how they say they just got to just got to make a crack so the light shines in. The question <laughs> is, they say, I mean, it's going to happen how soon and how much of this can help. It's a bit frustrating. I, I loved your story about Al Gore. He opened my eyes, but he was a black Angus farmer. And I don't think his mm -hmm. personal appearance reflected anything but somebody who ate a rich diet. And, mm -hmm. you know, now we have Bill Gates who writes a book that uh, says that yeah. we, every every option has to be considered. And there's nothing that should be left off the table. And he does his interviews in a, in a burger joint in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. You know, it's, yeah, how are we gonna, I mean, how, how are we going to get, boy, if we right. get somebody like Bill Gates or. Well, or okay, or, so that's right. And you, you're, you're spot on. I really love the way you think. Um, you kind of always a, a little step ahead in, in your thought process of what I was going to say today, but that that's true. Right. So it's a good, no, no, it's great. It's a, it's a good segue. So I was going to say one of the spokes uh, of, of the, of what we need to do of the entire overview of where I think we need to go with this and where my plan is, is how to address those with a platform of influence, Bill yeah. Gates, uh, Al Gore, uh, Paul Hawken, who's doing Drawdown. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah right. th those are all. So, But we first have to recognize, like you said, what their intent is. Now, so let's very quickly go over that because, and si similarly with, uh, um, uh, well, there are a number of them. I can go over a, a whole list of them, but Elon Musk is another one, but um, also Bezos, you know, uh, the ones that are, you know, traveling to, you know, Mars and doing SpaceX right. and all that. Okay. So here's the issue at hand for that. Okay. Um, I, I believe they have a platform uh, monetarily and otherwise uh, of influence. They just need to, uh, they need to be addressed. We need to sit down and have a chat with them. And I've got some feelers out there and I, I, this is not a pie in the sky thing, but so first you have to recognize where they're coming from. Elon Musk is, you know, my first book was, as you know, is titled Comfortably Unaware. He's a very smart guy, but his intentions are, are all technology based. He has no real clue about my, my lectures. He really doesn't. And he's not doing the right thing. So that just means we have to sit down and have a you know chat with him about it. Then, but the other one is Al Gore. You know, I mean, the the sad issue with Al Gore is, is that he still maintains, as you know, a forty a four hundred acre farm just east of Nashville, and they breed and uh, and breed and raise and slaughter and eat uh, four or five different types of of, uh, of animals. And uh, which is unbelievably sad. He calls it regenerative agriculture. So this is a really big topic that I hope you'll invite me back for. You know, we need to talk about this because that's a whole topic in itself. It isn't it? It's a whole topic. Every and all your viewers are are caught with this. You know, every day because there's always a, a larger whatever we're working on. There's a larger push with more money for those that just want to cling on to that false sense of 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 needing versus just wanting to eat animal products. Well. Al Gore is doing this with the regenerative agriculture. Uh, uh, so is Paul Hawken. Out of the 82 stipulated uh, uh, methods of, of what we can do to change the world for climate change, only one is related to uh, plant-based food. And even that is a watered down statement about plant forward. That's sort of the new term for uh, eat less meat, which as you know, is bizarrely subjective and won't get us anywhere. Um, but he doesn't want to lose his audience. You know, he has a he has the largest funded platform on the web right now for for uh, uh, how to pull out of climate change. It's very well done. It's an eloquent uh, oh, yeah. website. But and you've seen it, I'm sure. But the fact is, some, you know, I have some plans. So we need to sit down with him and make sure he understands the civil pastoral and the you know the agroforestry and the uh, holistic management and the regenerative agriculture. He has like seven or eight names for the exact same thing of grass-fed beef, which as you know, is, is, 
is pathetically wrong. I mean, there's there's nothing uh, about grass-fed beef that's going to be more sustainable. It uses, as you know, more water, more land. It 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 it, uh, it lessens biodiversity um, and uh, creates more greenhouse gases, and it has a higher feed conversion ratio. And I think people need to really understand that, which which all these wealthy people with platforms don't. We're running out of land and water and energy and fossil fuel use. And so, you know, if they sat here and really understood that grass-fed beef that they're propon their proponents of are, you know, they have a footprint of about 70 to one in terms of how, how much uh, um, uh, feed goes in to produce one pound of what they call food, you know, afterwards, which then, as you know, and everybody, you know, all your audience knows from your great work that it's just promoting ill health. So, and, and, and in the other direction, you can have one pound of, uh, you know, just pick like broccoli. One pound of broccoli will produce 16,000 pounds. One, one pound of broccoli seeds will produce 16,000 pounds of broccoli. It's like the reverse out. It's like, it's really unbelievable the difference in efficiencies of land use. And yet here's one of those six out of nine planetary boundaries that we've already surpassed. So, you know, which is which is land use or land system change. So how do we how do we correct that? You know, it's it's kindergarten. So somebody who needs to sit down like me or you, which I have full yeah. plan plans to do with these people like me Paul Hawken. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna join me. Paul Hawken, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates is another story. So he's just invested. This is a huge topic. He's just invested quite a bit of money in um, laboratory uh, produced meat cellular, you know, me. Yeah. Um, and um, because that they think, you know, Bill Gates thinks that's the way of the future. At the same time he's doing that, though, he's promoting livestock um, in uh, countries like Ethiopia, where Ethiopia is already suffering from poverty and hunger and ill use of land. And they have the largest herd of, of uh, livestock in, in Africa. So it's a it's a it's disgraceful, really, what Bill Gates is doing with the developing countries and what he's doing with developing or de helping to develop uh, laboratory meat, which, along with regenerative agriculture, is considered the wave of the future. Again, because people just want to hang on so badly to that false sense of needing meat. Um, but he thinks it's healthy for the environment. It's healthy for human health, you know, for human health. And he thinks it's, uh, um, you know, ethical. Well, they use fetal bovine serum. And that's not ethical. And as you know, they have this, this faulty cell line that's proliferating, you know, exponentially. And, and, and what's that? We don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, advo I'm not stating that it's going to cause cancer, but why would you want to do that? And, and the statement that the, uh, say Josh Tetrick is also, uh, pushing a, a billion dollars worth towards cellular meat. Um, you know, his statement is, gee, now we don't have to use all the, all the, we don't have to cut down forests and use all the water because now we don't need, need the animals. Well, we could just use cells of the animals. Well, again, I, I don't know where he's been since like the Neanderthal days, but we've never needed animals, you know, to eat, you know, healthier to protect our planet. So this whole idea of cellular or laboratory meat is backwards as well. So the point is we have to address these people with platforms of influence and um, in a couple of different ways. There are a number of, of people who can affect the public that are entertainers and musicians and, and these wealthy individuals um, that I, I plan to, you know, I have a, a, a very broad whiteboard plan and I just have to kind of keep moving it forward. And I, I just started a couple of months ago, so I'm hoping I, I can get it going. I know you did. I know you did, but you're such a powerful person. It, I, I think you can accomplish these things that you're talking about. Let me just tell you what I, what I see when I see somebody like Bill Gates uh, trying to solve our planetary problems with fake meat. Hmm. Uh, I see him not thinking he can give it up personally. He just thinks he would That's starve right. to death. That's right. And, uh, you know, there's, right. there's yep. a lot of the public that <clears throat> believes that protein is important. Protein yeah. is the most destructive thing to our environment and to people's mm -hmm. health. You know, there's mm -hmm. a, there are four dietary myths that I talk about on our new website, which is the McDougallFoundation.org. I talk about uh, the deadly dietary deceptions, which are, you know, which are you have to eat meat to get protein. You have to drink milk to get calcium. You eat fish to get omega-3 fats. It's just complete nonsense. Or that yeah. starches are fattening. You know, we have to get past this information. Of course, the, uh, the food business has spent 100 years trying to teach people these things so they can make money. But it's, but it's time to stop. Even, even these food producers, you know, grocery store owners, they have children and grandchildren too. They've got to realize the big picture. 
So yeah, let's go do. after. Let's go after them. I, you got yeah. some great ideas and uh, and obviously must, some good. Yeah. So so it's a what you're saying in a condensed fashion is it's very true. We need to address this um, sort of bilaterally. You know, we, we need to make sure that the human health component in a condensed, very uh, summarizing, uh, well-referenced, which you are, uh, uh, method has to combine with the environmental aspect uh, because you're right. It's uh, many people just don't care, even if they heard what the environment, e even if they heard they're responsible with their larger than life footprint, that um, they wouldn't care. They would think somehow they would want to overlook it um, because of the dietary aspect. They believe that, I mean, it must drive you, I mean, we have lots of things to talk about, actually. It must drive you crazy. Really, you must be so uh, upset about the, like the keto diet to lose weight because oh, it's yeah. everywhere now. It's everywhere now. And, um, and that's just perpetuating all the things that you talk about. But for me, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just destroying more and more of our resources um, with people just only inundated by the myth of what these food producers or the keto diet producers or marketers are, are placing in front of them. So anyway, we can, we can do this. Um, I'm quite sure we can do this. We just have a lot of spokes, you know, to the wheel that all have to be turning at the same time. Similarly with COP, you know, 27, uh, we need to, I'm working on that right now. I don't, uh, I'm hoping I have enough time to complete, you know, um, an introductory paper and then see if there's some way I can sneak in there, you know, for the COP27 to, because the door, again, the door has been open and there is a way, well, let's do it this way. I'm going to revert back. I'm going to circle back around if you don't mind at the, towards the beginning and we were talking a little bit about, you know, the door has been open. Well, one quick aspect of that or example is, um, even though you and I know, I mean, it, it's a far cry from what needs to be done, but at least there was a pledge, okay, it's weak, it doesn't have parameters, it doesn't have metric, it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have uh, um, stiff fines, uh, nothing's legal about it, but 105 of the 195 or 200 countries that were there for COP, you know, the Conference of the Parties for Climate Change, uh, signed on to re at least reduce methane by 30% by the year 2030, which how ridiculous is that marketing phrase, you know, let's reduce oh. methane by 30% by the year 2030. I mean, how bizarre is that? If we need to reduce it, just reduce it. And so yeah. to zero, to zero. So here's the story. They at least did that. So you can kind of see my thinking about this. And I know you know, I know you know where I'm going with this, but so that's what I mean by the foot in the door. 10 years ago, they weren't discussing this at COP you know, 12 or, or COP 16. So Right now, if if part of the um, part of uh, Biden's uh, uh, health program or the or excuse me the Build Back Better program, uh, they've already set aside 17 billion dollars um, to um, uh, to put forth in uh, to reduce fossil fuel emissions, specifically methane, to reduce. And they're finding they're finding the gas and oil industry. Uh, it's going to be. Um, you know, a few hundred dollars, nine hundred dollar fine for per ton produced in 2023. It's going to work up to fifteen hundred dollars uh, per ton by 2025. That's a big step. But the problem is, is that fossil fuels are not the major producers of anthropogenic uh, methane. Uh, animal agriculture is, and there's no debate about that. You know, there's a little debate about how much of all greenhouse gases are being produced by animal agriculture. Well. Out of all the methane that's produced, first of all, I mean, I think your audience needs to know that methane is really what we should be going after first because it's a very, it's 120 times when it's initially produced. It's 120 times as powerful as carbon dioxide, but it's only over a 10, peer, 10 to 12 year period of time. Um, and, then, and then it'll break down into carbon dioxide, which will last a lot longer. Uh, but anyway, so the point is, is that if we can reduce methane to zero, um, that's a that's that's a significant step. So uh, now 40% of all the methane produced in the world is still uh, produced naturally. It's produced by uh, some wetlands, some some peatlands, some you know. Uh, it's just still produced naturally, uh, but 60% is produced anthropogenically by humans. Now of that, so that's the one we want to attack because Earth, the our Earth is our planet has always had a nice way of 
of balancing out methane and a little bit of carbon dioxide that's produced by volcanoes erupting every once in a while. It's always absorbed some into our oceans, let some go in the atmosphere, some into the trees that we are losing quickly. But it's always balanced out about 20 to 26 gigatons per year for, for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, well now we're pumping in two to three times, as I said at the beginning, two or three times that much anthropogenically. So Earth, the uh, planet can't absorb anymore. So that's all going up into our atmosphere and that's what's causing essentially climate change. So the issue is, is that if 60% of all the methane produced is by human, human causes, uh, over half of that is from animal agriculture. It's not from gas and oil and from coal where Biden and his team and everybody else has, and all the 105 countries are pledging where they're attacking, they're attacking gas and oil and that's fine. But they just don't want to talk about animal agriculture. So that's that's what I meant by the foot in the door. You know, I'm going to have these facts in front of them and it's hard to dispel them. It's hard to dispel them. It's not, you know, me picking them out in my clinical, you know, my my clinic operatory one day, you know, and those are very well-documented facts. So if we can reduce, the first step is to even track it correctly. Only 18% of all, all producers of methane, including uh, especially farms, uh, globally even track their methane production. So the first step is tracking. That can be done within a year, you know, to regulate tracking. Then the next year we could uh, drop it down to 50% and two years later to zero. We don't have to work on 30% by the year 2030. It could be easily zero methane produced by the year 2030 and 50% in the next two years. That's my plan. It's, it can be very easily accomplished. So anyway, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about, about being, you know, having a foot in the door and there is a very positive way that we can attack this. Well, you know, I, one of the things that I have recently learned uh, that I think the public should be aware of is that if we, uh, if we concentrate on fossil fuels and eliminating them as the first step, uh, we're in big trouble. And the reason is, is with fossil fuel burning, you create particulate matter up in the atmosphere, which reflects sunlight. And that particular matter, it, it disappears in a matter of a few days. And if that disappeared, you weren't reflecting the sunlight uh, back into the, the uh, into outer space. And instead it was absorbed, we would increase our, we'd increase the, the, the heat in this planet by at least that one centigrade. So we, we yeah. really have to take care of the diet of people on the planet as paramount, not that we shouldn't be working on reducing fossil fuel. I don't, just don't see the public giving up their cars and turning off the electricity, but I can see them changing their diet, you know, because of the awareness of animal rights and abuse and, and because of the terrible health of people around the world, the obesity. You know, it's all yeah. the same thing. You, you, you know, you're eating the planet to death while well, you've eaten yourselves to death too. And it's yeah. also, it's so, so simple. It makes sense that plus people like potatoes. They like starch. They just, yeah. they just have been misguided, lied to. Yeah, they love potatoes. That's very true. Well, in on that note, uh, the most significant aspect of my uh, educating the educated <laughs> uh, yeah. is is actually to to have a fifteen minute TED talk slash European Parliament. You know what I did with them presentation that actually presents all the aspects within minutes of the current state of our planet undeniably. And then that it's not climate change, that it's not just climate change, but that's the foot in the door. Say, hey, here's the problem. Here's how we can read here. Not, not just adapt to, that's, this is the term that's being used by politicians and United Nations that we have to adapt to this and be resilient. We can actually mitigate it, complete mitigation within a couple of years. So, so it's, the presentation of the current state of our planet, uh, what what timelines run, meaning we've already surpassed six, uh, and how to reverse them out, uh, or start the steps toward reversing them out uh, beyond our our uh, at least get the steps in order beyond our uh, uh, you know beyond our generations, and then present to them all all those aspects of global depletion that all can be you know how can these be corrected just by changing your diet and, and agricultural systems? So, so in other words, you know, because 
it's all fragmented right now and then it's being squashed by the by the agricultural systems the industries themselves so not only is the education being squashed but the comprehensiveness of the easy the, the ease of understanding this is being squashed like those and those you know politicians that are receiving you know money from uh the meat and dairy industry um don't really understand uh also what it's doing oh. to our oceans and they don't understand what's doing to our water they don't understand what you know so if we can present this correctly and then look at how these farmers can still make money and you know like some of these i'm not going to read them all off but you know if they understood that there are many, aside from me, just my own uh, 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 extrapolations and calculations, they're, the World Economic Forum, which is you know highly regarded, has come out with similar figures just in the last two years, and and they've calculated that um, throughout the whole throughout the whole spectrum, there's more than what I'm talking about. There's also in the energy sector and infrastructure, uh, but just agriculturally speaking, there could be 200 million new jobs and trans transition jobs. <coughs> created globally that can produce $3.6 trillion just by the year uh, 2030, just by transitioning jobs from current agricultural systems, uh, whether it's fishing industries in our waters or on land, our, you know, our uh, meat and dairy industries. <clears throat> and, and these are by reforesting desertified areas, degraded areas, you know, nearly 60% of all of our uh, soil has already been degraded. And the United Nations right. even came out with a statement a few years ago uh, they believe that 90% of all of our soil will be gone just in the next 60 years. Well, why? Well, it's because we've deforested because of animal agriculture, and then we've created erosion, and we try, we're still trying to stampede, you know, with these grazing, you know, all these lands with uh, stampeding, uh, even if they're not, even if they're, I know somebody will be listening that's involved in regenerative agriculture will say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about, about that. Okay, well, let's say you're casually or carefully, tactfully rotating, it's it's called, you know, uh, uh, rotational grazing. Let's say you do everything according to Joel Salatin and, you know, uh, Alan Savory's techniques and now uh, Paul Hawken. Well, there is no uh, operation anywhere on this planet that would that would uh, be able to uh, increase biodiversity, uh, increase water use or decrease water use, decrease land use, uh, help human health, and reforest and draw down all the greenhouse gases we put in since the 1850s and uh, pre-industrial times. There's no, no agricultural systems that could even touch plant-based systems. And that those are facts. There's not somebody's opinion. No. And um, so anyway, I think once we do that and we place this in front of, you know, politicians and place it in front of United Nations and COP27, and then start some of these public awareness programs that I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about just Dr. McDougall and Dr. Oplan are talking in a library, which would be good. You know, those, those are good. But the day, the days for talking in a library to 20 people, unless those 20 people were Bill Gates and people who can go out immediately disseminate quickly, we're on timelines. So we need to, we need to the information given in a massive way to millions and millions of people all at once. And I've got a couple ideas about that. So I'm not, I'm not giving up yet. So I, I don't, I don't want you to, I don't want you to, to a change the belief that good will overcome evil and that the truth will prevail. It's what keeps me going too. And yeah. I'd just like yeah. to add one thing, maybe give you a chance for your voice to recover. You've had a lot of really important words. Is mm -hmm. that uh, there's an example of how the world got together and changed, or at least a, a large population of people did. It, it was back when we just had the, the telegraph for communication, no radios or TVs. It was in uh, Denmark when. Um, the three million Danes were faced with starvation due to the British blockade in the North Sea. They, the, the British uh, the, were trying in, during World War One. They, they were trying to um, starve out the Germans. And what the Danes decided to do, under the direction of Michael Hinhidi, is they decided to eat the foods the animals ate and to stop eating the animals. And so they went through this three-year period of time, World War One. And uh, they had the best health that the Danish people have ever had. So if you can communicate this kind of need under those circumstances with, with just a telegraph, yeah. and today 83% of the people walking around have these uh, little communication devices called cell phones. Yep, yep. Even yep. though there are 7 billion people, you know, if, if, if it's true that good prevails over evil and the truth will 
will rise to the top, then we have a chance. We do. Because we can talk to those 7 billion people and say, look, th this is so much more, well, to the Danes, it wasn't more important than winning in World War I. You know, it was their life. Right, and, right. Uh, but it's our life too. We just, we can do it. I know we can do it. Well, we and can do it. it. You know, that's a great story, but one quick thing, and then I want you to keep going, but is, you know, essentially, this is this is World War Three. Essentially, it's just that it's not it's not a war that one can easily uh, place into a parameter of previous wars. It's it's a it's essentially uh, a war of uh, how we are ruined. You know, we, by it's it's somewhat of a it's an interesting thing because we, if the perspective is we've done this to ourselves, so it's a war that we've created ourselves. That you know uh, against the the lack of education and then the, you know the lack of awareness and then lack of action and thereby it's going to be an, a slow a slower attrition until finally and we're seeing it today it's very measurable uh, but we have to it, it's it's the single most important thing even though other issues will 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 creep up into the picture as being you know more acutely uh, concerning this is the the by far the most important uh, 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 issue that we have facing us as a species. And there's no question about that. Well, the way I put it, and I, I still practice as a doctor and take care of uh, a few people, quite a few people, is the way I put it, you know, when they talk about other things, I just tell them it's the food. You know, it's the food that's going to save your health and the health on the planet, and, and we can do it. But uh, you know, unfortunately, things are moving very slow. And that's why we got to get you back out on the road. You've had enough yeah. time off, Dr. <laughs> I, know. I have. It's, I'm, I'm ready. I, to go. I see. I can see your spirit. You're still. You're still excited and alive, and, and you want to make a difference. And so, you know, I, I as I say, I, I got kind of slowed down there for a while, and I know you did. But it's, it's time. It's time we just. We just beat them. We just got to get over there and no matter what, what the consequences, like you said, you know, you don't have enough time. Well, my question is, do you sleep? You yeah, know, no. you've got more time. <laughs> some, some nights I don't, but you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. I, I'm, I'm going to take care of myself enough and you, you need to take care of yourself. Yeah. Because we, the world, the world needs you. And I want to say one summarizing thing about what you just stated. Um, it is true. It's, it's a, it's a, one, two, or one, two, three punch, essentially. I mean, individuals, as sad as it is, they have to know how some, how a change is going to affect them personally and how it's going to check to affect their pocketbook, for instance, which yeah. is sad. But those are all those all can be answered quite nicely. I've got that written up into one of the spokes as well. But but the bottom line beyond that is, and I've often said this, is that um it doesn't matter and your audience needs to know this you you need to keep you know because it is a one two punch so you got to hit that one punch first with human health but it really it, it, it but at the end of the day long term it doesn't matter how healthy you are if our planet's not healthy you you no. you could be the you could be the healthiest person in the world but if our planet by the time another generation goes by is going to have all those of that drastic effects of climate change have you know, right now, 40% uh, shortage in wa water, uh, water scarcity is going to be 40% uh, less water by just the year 2030. We're going to have, you know, millions of species of ants and uh, plants and a animals um, that are going to be extinct, uh, which we owe, you know, we, it's, our, it's, you know, we're the stewards oh. here. We owe them a greater life than that. That's uh, oh, so yeah, sad. Yeah. It's so yeah. sad. And our oceans and all that, even unrelated to climate change, you know, it's our responsibility to make a healthier planet for those children and grandchildren and those those people who come after us. We don't want to be we don't want to be the generation that future generations are pointing their finger at saying they knew. Look at Dr. Yeah. McDougall has a has a book. Dr. Oplander, you look at his lectures he gave. I mean they knew. Why wasn't anybody listening? Yeah. And look look at where we are now. This is like 50 years from now. You know, and so we don't want we want our ethos to be the defining ethos has to be that we recognize what our parents started, you know, ruining essentially, and we changed it. And we did, we took the steps to change it. Uh, you know, the, the way I try and put it is that uh, I don't want my grandchildren to ever say, Grandpa, why didn't you try harder? 
you know, when I gave that presentation at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine back in October 2019, after I gave the presentation, I explained to 500 physicians and dietitians who are completely interested in vegan nutrition. You know, and they were there, a lot of them were there to learn, a lot of them were there to get their certification at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, a young doctor came up to me and he says, you know, I really heard what you're saying. He says, how do I practice medicine on a dead planet? You know, you can't do anything on a dead planet. So well, all that? of us have everything to stay at stake. You know, it's not, it's not a matter of you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna be one of the ones that ends up okay. You're not gonna be okay. Right. You know, everybody all, all, from the mountaintops to the seashores, uh, you know, North and South America it doesn't make any difference. It's going to get all of us if we don't get this fixed. And, That's and right. I, those, I still believe we can fix it. <clears throat> yeah. And those physicians, first of all, congratulations on that well-deserved award. I mean, the, kudos to you. That was, that was wonderful that they could recognize, you know, your work. Each and every one of those physicians, though, needs to have, and this is one of those other spokes, they need to know, first of all, the importance of your work and how to apply that, not, no. not, not, not intermittently, but uh, exhaustively, uh, inclusively with, you know, with everybody, all their patients. They, and then along with that, they have, to have, uh, they have to have a little tag along saying, by the way, uh, you're, this is the only way we can save our planet, basically. So it's not just, you know, the human health. They're going to have to have some way to connect it. And I didn't have the ability, I, I spoke there too. They asked me to be a keynote speaker about the environment. And they told me, and this was before I, I had to take a step back too. It was like 2016. So it was three years before you spoke there and uh, won that wonderful award. And um, I, you know, I, I want you to, um, uh, to interpret this correctly. I know you will, uh, but your listeners, but I, I was asked to speak there as a keynote speaker, spoke specifically about the environment, which I think all physicians needed to hear. Yeah. So got a standing ovation. Um, yeah. Well, listen, nothing yeah, happened afterwards. Nothing happened, no. nothing happened afterwards. No. And, and okay. I, I was so upset. Now, the only difference is I didn't have the tenacious, you know, I, I had to take a step back just, I think it was like nine months later. And so, but now I'm back. So I'm going to go after them and yeah. say, here's what we need to do, you know, Absolutely. but anyway. This is a group of doctors that know about food. I mean, that's yeah. all I know about. It. I told yeah. them, I said, look, you guys do not know how to install solar panels. You don't know how to build Teslas. You know, you've got talent. And that's what I ask everybody out there. You've got talents and you've got to express those and, and yeah. make a contribution. Because yep. the, the truth has become more and more obvious every day. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we've had this chance to talk and I can see your yep. enthusiasm. And I sure hope uh, that you and I can get together regularly and talk to our audience and explain to them that uh, there are still many people in the fight. And yep. uh, it's well worth every bit of effort that we put into it. And, and right. I, I'm, I'm glad you're back. I'm back. And we're, we're going to go mercilessly. We're going to go after that. <laughs> we well, are. Dr. You know, I, I, I appreciate this. It's a privilege for me always to to, to speak with you. And uh, we have so much more to talk about, though. So, we do. We do. <laughs> and it's an ongoing discussion. It's that people are going to yeah. visit uh, the McDougal Foundation, McDougalFoundation.org, which is where these, these uh, presentations will appear. Uh, by you and other experts, and and we will we'll kind of bring people along on our movement. But we have to ask them to join us. We need an army. You know, yeah. I, you're 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 a little younger than me, but there there was a time when we had a Vietnamese conflict, and we were in the streets burning our draft cards. Where That's are right. the kids in the streets burning right. whatever? Certainly, right. I hope they're not burning meat. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they, they, no. They, 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 it's time for a revolution. It is, and I think we can get we can do that. We just need we need to uh, we need to gather the forces, but we also yeah. need a master plan. And I have that in the works. And we, okay. you're one, you're you. It'd be wonderful to have uh, us, you know, combine efforts right. and move things forward as best as possible. So I think we yeah, can we do just, it. We just need we just need a little help, a little break, and, and we'll get it. Uh, you know, we're in it for for our lifetime, and so. It was, yeah. It's been a great hour to spend with you. And again, I would strongly uh, encourage you to go to the 
to our uh, uh, for-profit website, which is, which is drmcdougall.com and just put in the question section, uh, Oppenlander. And you'll listen to an hour and 20 minute presentation that'll get you glued to your seat. And you've been able to add a lot to your work and you've also been able to give me and the other folks a lot of encouragement that, that we're, you know, we're gonna do the job. We're gonna, we're gonna get out we there will. and fight to the end, that's it. So we I wanna will. thank you, I wanna thank you very much for <laughs> spending time with me and, and we'll be, you know, in other ways we'll be in touch and we'll just move yeah, things absolutely. Right Absolutely. Thank can't, can't thank you enough for uh, this moment in time and can't thank you enough for your work. So uh, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much. Let's, let's stay in touch. All thank right. you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.